Good morning and welcome back to WKNI TV 25. We are in the pleasure and honor of having uh, Senator Jimmy Holly back with us once again. Senator, thanks for coming on. And thank you for having me. Before we get started, I've got a question. I want uh, you to tell me about your son. Oh! I don't know where you uh, talked to the audience about it, but there's a lot of interest in uh, his service overseas and when he's going to be home, and I really want to hear about it. So you take the you, you let me be the interview for the, for the start. You go right ahead because I want to hear. I want to hear I'm about I'm one it. proud daddy. I know you are, and, rightly and the, so. Thank you, sir. Uh, well, uh, I we are not allowed to say the days, right? Okay, but there's less days. There's less. There's less Soon. days. Okay, than that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that he'll be in the United States. And he was over there for how long now? Uh, he'll be gone a year when he gets home. Wow. And uh, he, um, we talked to him uh, this morning. We talked to him almost every day. And um, he's uh, excited to get back with his wife and children, of course. And uh, wow. uh, he calls me big guy, and he says, well, I can't <laughs> wait till I get hold of my big guy when I get home. Are you going to have him on this show, I, oh, I okay. hope? <laughs> okay. Yeah. We're going to bump you and all good. the other politicians to put him good. on. But, uh, uh, you know, he's excited to come home. And thank you for asking. Well, I, I, I genuinely thank him for his service to this country and all those other young men and women that are serving over there and uh, what a what a great thing they do for us and we're we're pleased that he'll soon be home well he's proud to done what he's done he's just like I said excited to come home and and uh, you know we just need to get them all home yeah so yes sir every single one of them and, and uh, it's just no place to be when you're in a place like that we've got enough going on in this country and we'll be talking about that a little bit today too and, and in this state but uh, thank you so much for asking. Well, I was interested. I'm, I, I'm glad that he'll soon be home safe and sound. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit about the legislature. Yeah, that, yeah. that seems to be its battleground of its own. Well, we got about uh, two-thirds of the way uh, on this session, meaning 30 legislative days. We've finished 21 or 22 of them. Anyway, we've got about eight to go, about a third of the session left. Uh, the general fund budget has passed. Uh, it's not... It's a balanced budget, let me say that, but it's balanced with some one-time money that was borrowed from the Alabama Trust Fund by vote of the people of Alabama. And there's also money in that budget to pay back the first installment of those monies that were borrowed from the trust fund. So we hopefully at the end of uh, a few years that the trust fund, the Alabama Oil and Gas Trust Fund called the Alabama Fund is, is made whole and that uh, this was not just a crash landing for the budget, but softened the landing time, gave us more time to work out our, our problems with it. And uh, so it, although it's a balanced budget, it's not just an absolutely beautiful budget. It has some rough spots in it. It's, but uh, we, we hope that it'll be adequate to fund the services of state government. Well, Senator, there's a lot of uh, talk. We've had several guests on talking about the consolidation of different agencies in, in uh, the state. Uh, we had um, uh, former, well, retired uh, ABC uh, Lieutenant Price on here uh, a few weeks back, and he was talking about how it's kind of all changed in his mind, too. He was pretty much against all that, mm -hmm. and now in talking with you and talking with uh, Representative Mike Jones and others, um, he has kind of seen the, the, the voters' side of it, mm -hmm. the constituent side of it, the consolidation. Um, this budget this year has been, like you said, it's been a nightmare. It's I think what the enforcement community has told us, for the, for the first time, a bill was presented to them to consolidate and, and, and make services better, as opposed to consolidate and fire people. Right. That was not our intent. It was not to downsize, although there are some places where we can shift employees to different uh, job positions and you have needs in some areas and less needs in others so some agencies w were better funded than others and, and better equipped and we're going to we're, we're going to implement a plan of uh, communication where these many number of a state agents and employees can communicate with each other and uh, I, I'm willing I'm glad to see that the perception is that this was a good thing for Alabama. It was not intended to be cruel and, and, and uh, insensitive to the fact that the employees are doing their job. 
and but we want to do a better job and we want to do it more economically we have to and you take the consolidation uh, plan we we believe that uh, it will save somewhere around 30 million dollars when fully implemented that we could uh, get the better services and and save 30 million dollars for the state of Alabama's general fund so it's uh, a, a good thing I believe well, I'm I'm looking forward to it because it's it's uh, going to be less agencies, less uh, bureaucratic red tape, as they call it, uh, to get involved. And in, in you you got one head to go to, and, and that's they, you do, and and you won't have a state automobile with state gas going in one direction with a uh, law enforcement officer with the rest powers, and the other law enforcement officer going in the opposite direction, uh, and not be able to share communications. To, to be able to complement each other in the enforcement of the law. And this is why we think that the, this particular bill will be so, uh, so good for the state of Alabama. Senator, we're, we're talking about money. And usually money means if you're going to have it, management and, and how to spend it. Between the legislature, between the House and the Senate, uh, there has been great concern about the, the ability to gather uh, the general fund money and things like that over the next few years because mm -hmm. there's nothing out there to replace what we have. It's true. The education budget, as we've said before, I think on your show and other times, the education budget's revenue streams are uh, income tax, both personal and uh, individual, corporate right. and individual income tax, and sales tax. And, uh, you know, if you sell a, 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 new, a, a product, for a thousand dollars this year, and next year it costs you twelve hundred dollars, and that, in and of itself, will raise revenue for the education trust fund. So when when you look at the inflationary trends that we have built into those that respond to growth and prices in the education trust fund, you will end up at the end of the year with a projection of more re revenue. Now the general fund, co contrary uh, to that, is Fees, fines, and penalties, and license, $2 this year is $2 next year, and $2 next year unless it's raised, and they don't, they don't respond to inflation or growth in prices. And therein why, is why the general fund doesn't have a real growth potential. It only has a, a real steady revenue stream. The uh, Education Trust Fund responds to inflation uh, more so than the general fund does. So when we have like fuel increases, when we have uh, cost of living increases, like you mentioned, uh, it's salaries, salaries, it, it's new jobs. Mm -hmm. It's reflected on the education and the education side, but of not the on the general, sheet. which the entire state has to run under. Absolutely, yes, sir, you're so exactly right. Is there any way that uh, we can find a way? Well, to over the last several years, the legislature uh, has been able to shift some of the collections. Uh, from the education trust fund without, uh, you know, without being able to determine uh, that the general fund was in need uh, or were able to ascertain that the general fund was in need, I might say, and that the education trust fund, we took some of those resources and earmarked them to the general fund, which to some degree, we, we made a few changes in it, but it's still not a, uh, enough to from, that you can say that this is a growth fund. It is still a rather static, but it's strong in its level. It's the same as almost from year to year, which is a strength of the general fund that uh, is not quite uh, there in the education, tr education trust fund. You know, there's another bill dealing with consolidation, I think, that is worthy of some discussion. Ed, if you if you got a sure. time, it uh, has to do with the information technology, computers and software. And I've, in the studio here this morning, as I sat waiting for you to get through hooking up your uh, technology, you have a vast array of technology in this particular uh, studio. Correct. Well, the state of Alabama, almost every agency, I'd say every agency in state government, has uh, information technology component to it. Some of it is huge, like uh, public safety, uh, revenue department, uh, uh, health department. M much of it is, is, is there 
and, and, and then you got the complementary software packages that go with it. We found in a study that led us to this consolidation uh, and, and putting somebody over information technology was that the computer at the health department may not talk or share information with the other departments that the uh, state trooper computer did not communicate to uh, another department. So we had every department had over the years evolved where its software and its hardware were just a little uh, island unto itself and you didn't share information and you didn't share, uh, share economy of scale on purchasing and contracts to manage those things. And also we found that uh, if, you, if you don't invest and keep up to date with technology, you soon get like we found a particular agency that they were having to go to the scrap heap and, and find parts to repair their uh, computers with and their laptops and, and so forth because they couldn't buy them anymore. It was that much out of date. Believing that to be the case, we think when fully implemented, and, and I really think this is way underestimated, that it'll be another 20 or 30 million dollar in savings to the state when we finally get uh, the programs in place to do purchasing and management of software and hardware in the IT section for the umbrella all of state government, not just individual islands and components. The important thing that I see that you just mentioned on that, one of the important things, is that when you, you talk about uh, being able to purchase on a state level, currently it's purchased by the state police, it's purchased by uh, the state fire marshal, it's per in each individual department, and, and it's not used as a conglomerate overall to get the bit bigger discounts, like for tire. oh, I'm sorry, for tires, yes, sir. okay? And uh, if you were to go buy, buy tires for a, uh, uh, say, a state patrol vehicle, you, you get the for that rate for that department, yes. but if you combine the entire state, state trucks, straight vehicles, uh, road vehicles, all nine yards, you end up with a bigger discount. One of the things that has brought this to our attention also, and, and you're really going to appreciate this, is as we had uh, hurricanes and tornadoes in the state, we found that these 20-something or plus uh, law enforcement agencies wanted to do and needed to do and they were willing to do and they had the manpower to do but they couldn't talk with each other they could not coordinate the efforts uh, like you and i would want them to do right. and they knew it also so some of the changes that are coming about with the consolidation and with the it proposals they're inter interwoven is the uh, need for cooperation and coordination in times of emergencies. Would this be the digital communications? It would be that and in other more modern, up-to-date, better means of uh, relating the uh, uh, enforcement of the laws of the state of Alabama to the different state agencies, whatever they are. That makes a lot of sense because that way uh, when we're strapped for manpower in one part of the state. Now our schools for several times, especially our higher education community, we are to be commended. Uh, several years ago, they, through the legislature, created the supercomputer authority. They funded the supercomputer authority, put members from the different schools into a coordinating council, and we appropriated money to the supercomputer that was located at that time in Huntsville, Alabama, but the overall purpose of the supercomputer, apart, uh, supercomputer authority evolved to a degree that uh, the higher education community actually has had this coordination of purchasing and management and services uh, for a number of years, and it was really a good model for the, us to look at and follow when we were proposing this uh, Information Technology Act that we did. Senator, we're going to take a quick break, let some of our sponsors pay for our IT and technology <laughs> that we have here that you mentioned, okay. and uh, we certainly appreciate you coming on. When we come back, we'll talk about uh, some of the issues you, or some of the things you have uh, that you brought with you, but I'd like to talk about the uh, camaraderie of uh, uh, the Senate, uh, which I've heard has been kind of uh, under the weather uh, in Montgomery of late. 
and uh, talk about what you think might be the the benefit to or how that might be worked out down the road okay. and uh, the the house and, and everybody seems to seems to be a little bit of discontent up, up in Montgomery but with that being said folks we'll be right back you know what you got to say right I'll keep it real keep it real keep God in it <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back with more right after these messages with Senator Holly Good morning and welcome back to WKNI TV 25. We have Senator Holly here. We're glad to have him on every Good chance morning. we have. And uh, Senator, we when we left, uh, we were talking about consolidation and we were talking about how, you know, the things are going to be a lot better as far as putting things together uh, and joining things in unity to make them go easier. All right? Yes, sir. Well, what do we do with the Senate and the House <laughs> <laughs> to do this? Because uh, it's uh, honestly, we've heard there's been some real, real uh, battles going on. Uh, there has, and, and you know, in, in everybody's mind, I suppose actions are justifiable. But there are th uh, 35 members of the Senate, if you would recall. Right. Uh, they represent the same number of people, approximately in each district. The 105 members of the House. Uh, the house, and and uh, from an outside vantage point, looks like it's functioning rather smoothly. Uh, the Alabama Senate uh, has had uh, uh, has had its bumps this year so far. However, the last couple of days have, or three days have been very, very productive and very good. Prior to that, though, it was contentious. It was filibuster. It was read bills at length, uh, closure petitions things that you don't you normally want a lot of debate on you under that scenario you don't get the open debate that you normally would hope for so hopefully the legislature works better when and you don't want to you don't want us to go up there and be in harmony on everything you want right. us to go up there and debate and 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 be tenacious about our positions on particular bills but to do it on every procedural, procedural motion, that becomes dilatory, and it, it just wastes an awful lot of time, productive time, that we could be looking at trying to fix some of the problems of the state. However, it's a constitutional right for individuals to represent their constituency in the manner in which they think is the most uh, 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 productive for them. I hope now, though, that we will go and have a a last third of the session, and we've completed, as I said, about two-thirds of it. Maybe the last third of the session will be like the last couple of days. We can build on it. We've still got an education budget that uh, has pa will to pass, and there are bills dealing with the state parks at Orange Beach, a convention center that's being considered. There's a, there's a lot of legislation up there that would be very good to in a, to be able to debate, and uh, some of it will pass, and and some of it won't, and uh, that's really where we find ourselves about two thirds of the way through this session, Eddie. One of the bills that I re recall over the past couple of months that uh, kind of really laid heavy in the in the Senate, and that was the uh, I can't remember what bill it was, the number on it, but it had to do with protection of the Second Amendment right. And, yes, and that kind of, uh, our own Mike Jones, Jr., had his own bill uh, through the House, yes. but he yielded to the one in the Senate, and yet that still had a lot of stuff added on to it. The one in the Senate was Senator Scott Beeson from Gardendale, who was up above Birmingham, introduced the bill, I, I suppose, at the request of many members of the Senate. And it was an all-encompassing bill. It, it, it dealt with the Second Amendment rights to try to ensure that uh, the, the, when we believe, and I do, that the founders, of, the founding fathers did not accidentally pass uh, without forethought and without uh, a lot of design in our government, the Second Amendment. I think they meant to do it. And it says that we have the right to bear arms and to have a militia. And some of the courts over the years and some of the particularly in the federal level, have determined that we don't deserve to have our guns and have those gun rights. And uh, this legislation tried to d define and carve out what we in Alabama think is a proper way for the Second Amendment to apply to the citizens of this state. 
Senator, some of the sheriffs, though, weren't pleased with, with uh, the outcome or the potential outcome. And by the this. way, the outcome is not over. It's, it's now to be pass the right. House. It's passed the Senate, but not passed the House. And you're correct about the sh uh, some of the sheriffs. Uh, they, they particularly, um, you know, like a lot of us, we're, we're subject to review and think about uh, what we've done it this way for the last a uh, hundred years, and why, why do we want to change it? Well, the truth of the matter is it, it necessitated change because the federal courts and federal legislation is, is dictated. Mm -hmm. they're, they're infringed upon the Second Amendment rights that uh, should be controlled and, 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 and directed from the state level, not at the federal level. And I think that's some of the differences that we had and the differences of opinion and why they evolved in that direction. It almost takes me back to thinking about back in the 1880s when uh, uh, we had a, another situation where the states were trying to separate from the federal government under the, uh, or should I say the late 1800s, uh, with the Civil War where, you know, the states had their own, you know, uh, spoke, uh, spoke their own language. In other words, the government didn't run the local states. And, and that's kind of what's happened over the years, isn't it? Yes, I think the concept is the same as, uh, but the issues are distinctly different. We were, we were talking about slavery during that time, and there were those that were trying to apply slavery as a constitutional right to own someone else's service, and that's wrong. Right. Today, we're talking about owning a gun, having it in my house, having it in my possession, or having it in an automobile, having it on my property, as opposed to someone else dictating whether or not I can do that or not. We think the Second Amendment provides that ownership, that use, that uh, 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 gun right uh, portion of the Second Amendments into the uh, Alabama law, is, it was, was well uh, deserving the change that we were making. Senator, when, when you're, we talk about the laws and, and protection of, of our constitutional rights, <clears throat> normally that falls under the federal level when it comes to the constitutional rights. Here we're having to rewrite our constitution or add laws to to protect us from the federal government from taking our rights away. Uh, as uh, Mike Jones Jr. stated here one day, we're one uh, Supreme Court justice away from losing these rights and and it's scary and that's why he wanted to get the bill going and, and move forward with. Now. I hear it all the time, I read it in the newspaper, and I see it over the internet, that we already have laws protecting us from the criminal aspect of these people having guns. And it just seems uh, ridiculous to be trying to protect ourselves from criminals when we already have the laws. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? In, in other words, if you're a convicted felon, you're not supposed to have a gun. There are certain restrictions that states believe that we have the inherit right to place upon that and, and, and have a, a person with a mental, uh, not having the mental capabilities of making good decisions and it's been proven a convicted felon, uh, those, those type individuals, we want to continue to allow the sheriff to filter that uh, person uh, who might come into their uh, office and ask for a gun permit. We did, uh, however, in the dis in any denial for a pistol permit, and, and notice I didn't say gun permit because long guns are already exactly. defined and, and clear. It was the pistol part of the of the gun law that uh, if you're denied a pistol permit, you have an appeal process. You can appeal to the uh, district court for review, which is uh, an integral part of our laws too, where due process or which you're something you're looking for. In this case, it would be a pistol permit. You have the right for an appeal to a, a court to review that decision. So we don't have that now, is what you're saying? No, we do not. And that'll be added into... No, it's part of the new law. Well, yes, sir. Don't see nothing wrong with that. All right, let's step up and go to the governor's office real quick. We talked about the Senate. Uh, the governor has been tremendous in, in supporting a lot of uh, what's been going through the House and, and, and kind of had some words a while back about getting the Senate in line as well. And rightfully so. 
and we were encouraging him to help, and we welcome his help. Uh, he's a he's a quality individual that makes good judgment. He's an honest individual who is involved, and particularly he you may not see him out every day on TV, but you can bet he's on the telephone. He's trying to create jobs for the state of Alabama. I found that to be the most intriguing part of uh, of what is, uh, watching Governor Bentley operate, and that is his. Uh, just uh, uh, ongoing involvement in the day-to-day -day operations of ADECA and the re recruitment part of creating jobs for the state of Alabama and growing our economy. Well, he seems to uh, really get out there and not mind to take the, the, the lead and, and say what's really on his mind for the people. And, I agree uh, with you. Uh, he, he he had a few words for the Senate, and I don't, I don't remember exactly what they were, but I think it got y'all's attention a little bit. Well, they're, they're, it's hard to criticize your fellow senators when um, they're trying, in, in, my, in their mind's eye, to represent their constituency. And, of course, I'm trying to represent mine. I'd like to go and uh, vote on legislation and move on to the next one. And Governor Bentley was seeing some things he needed and wanted to pass, and uh, they were not moving as fast as he chose, so he, he did engage in asking that the Senate start working together a little bit better. And that's unusual because normally the governor does not get directly involved in that kind of... That's true. And uh, that's what I like about, personally, the uh, yeah. governor that we have now is he doesn't mind taking a stand where there has to be one. That's true. Now, we're going to probably take a quick break here in a few moments, but before we go to, to the break, um, we we covered a little bit about what the uh, Senate is passing, isn't passing. We're going to have you come back here and talk about some of the other issues that are facing the Senate right now. But I, I got a personal question to ask you uh, yeah. as far as uh, our Attorney General, Luther Strange. Uh, he went out <clears throat> as everybody knows, and uh, has basically put on a, a um, <laughs> I hate to use the word, war paint, okay, for the Indian reservations and the gambling in the state of Alabama uh, with those. Do you feel that's a prudent uh, means of using our money to file lawsuits against something that's federally regulated through the um, Indian uh, treaties that we've had over the many years? Eddie, I'd have to answer you in this manner. We have uh, three branches of government. We've got the executive branch, the judicial branch, and the legislative branch. Uh, Attorney General Strange is in the executive branch of government. And I certainly wouldn't be presumptuous enough to second guess what it is he is about. He may, he may know something I don't, or he may suspect things that I don't suspect. Uh, he's got his job to do. The legislature has its job. and. Our uh, fine governor has his job to do, and the judicial branch of government has its job. So as we, as we ponder those things that we might n not necessarily know why, uh, we can only hope that uh, he's doing it for the right reasons. The reason I ask you that is you are the lawmaker. Uh, we, but we don't implement them and we don't interpret them. We make them and then we hand them to somebody else. We don't do the enforcement, and we don't do the deciding whether we were right or wrong. That's the court's decision. I'll take you off the hot seat. We're going to go to a commercial break. <laughs> <laughs> and as Teresa sits over there and says every morning, you get to say, keep it. Uh, keep it real. <laughs> keep God in it. We'll get you trained right after a while. But uh, we want to remind people every day that God's, if you keep him in it, it's real. Thank you. In, in, uh, we're totally all about that here. But, folks, Senator DeHolly, uh, we surely appreciate him. When he comes back, we're going to be talking about uh, some of the issues that's on his mind that he wants to talk about. Fair enough? Yes, sir. All right. We'll be right back with more <laughs> right after this. Good morning and welcome back to WKNI TV. You see how she tried to catch me on that? There was a stall there. Did you see that, Senator? But uh, Good morning. Welcome back. We have Senator Holly. Uh, here this morning with us and, and uh, sharing with us a whole bunch of great information going on up there. Um, you know what? I got before we get into that. I found out something about you this past couple of weeks I didn't know. No, oh. and and it's a good thing. A lot of people stay in Montgomery, okay, during the session. 
You yeah. don't. You drive back and forth every day. If I can, I'd rather come home at night, spend a few hours with my family, and have a, uh, a, a hamburger in the in the uh, in in the in the house with with uh, my wife, and then I had to spend it in Montgomery, going to a, one of the receptions and so forth. It's uh, she it, appreciates it, that. Well, I don't know about that, but I, I, I she probably would would differ with you to some degree, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm fortunate she on occasion is able to go with me, and uh, it's uh, it's about an hour and 30 minute drive. Mm -hmm. And uh, although there's times I probably needed to stay in Montgomery, I, I much prefer to come home. Well, and I know this has nothing to do with anything, but I just want to talk about success. How long have you been in the Senate? I've been in the Senate. Uh, this is the since '98, so. Uh, uh. 15 and then 20 years in the house, 35, about 35, 35 total years. years. How long have you been married to this young lady? Uh, 45 years. Uh -huh. uh, she, she was from East Tennessee, almost uh -huh. in Virginia. and I, We were both in college at uh, Johnson City there at East Tennessee State University. We met and uh, I, I tricked her and she came home and blessed uh, my family. She stayed and uh, this is now her home. Uh, she tells me that, you know, given the given the choice, she now knows this is a place where she belongs, and and I'm so deli I'm so blessed to have a a beautiful young lady like that to come down and spend uh, her life with me and to create a uh, family with two beautiful children and now two grand grandchildren. That you just can't get over them grandbabies, can you? <laughs> Cannot. I'm telling you, and we're you know. We look at you when we get to see you as a family unit. <clears throat> you can just see it beaming off of both of you. Yeah. And and uh, the reason I ask this, I know it. it you said, Eddie, we're talking about this stuff here. No, the reason it's success. You've got 45 years with the the same fi soulmate. All right, and you've got 35 years or whatever it was with the uh, serving the community, serving you know as a representative of this community. But at the same time, you still equally try to divide everything to make it work and I'm going there to go to here okay. all right wouldn't that be a quality that we'd want to have in government to where they can have that kind of responsibility and maybe have a better quality of government I think sometimes experience is a, is a wonderful thing to have in, in, a, in a job or uh, whatever you're about to undertake whether it be uh, uh, creating something new and different or whether it's to implement something that you learned through the fact that you've been there before and done it. Uh, there are times when I feel like we're, as a, an older member of the legislature, able to add some things that would not otherwise be understood by some of the new people that come to Montgomery. I was a, I watched the new guy that came from Mobile the other day. He was uh, just elected because of a vacancy. And many of the terminology, uh, motions and procedures, and just the, how you start the legislative day, uh, he came later and says, you know, I, I learned today how to open the uh, legislative session. With the, uh, up until then, he didn't know it. But uh, there's also a lot to be said about fr a newness with having uh, someone come in without already having their mind made up or old ideas that are already stale and they have new fresh ideas so we uh, it's good to have a combination of both I think Eddie well we're proud to have you up there and you and your wife uh, because she is an integral part I feel absolutely in, in everything every decision you make uh, I'm sure uh, if you had any questions you certainly go to her first and, and talk with her about I'm, it. I'm uh, we got time to tell a quick story sure, go right ahead. Right after I was elected to the Senate, as a matter of fact, I came to a dinner over in Andalusia, and on the way over here, we met this uh, vehicle that had the headlights, and then they had the fog lights, mm. and they blinded me, they blinded her, and she says to me, I don't ask for much, but I think you ought to introduce a bill to outlaw those bright fog lights, and I said, well, that's sounds like uh, something that 
you, I'd like to see them turned off because they hurt our eyes, but how would you like me enforce it? Stop them and bust them out, or do you want me to, want me to unplug them? Well, <laughs> we got on down the road a few minutes. <coughs> she looked over at me and she says, you're a fine husband, but as a state senator right now, you're just not very good. <laughs> So anyway, she she's a delight to have around, and she wanted me to fix those bright lights in her eyes, but I I don't know how to get it unless I stop and bust them out. And I didn't well, want I was to gonna say that. which way were and you I didn't swing want, them? <laughs> I didn't. I just uh, went on down the road. <coughs> well, they do bother me, you know, and, and you know they and as you get older, your eyes are mm -hmm. getting a little bit more sensitive. At least mine are, mm -hmm. and and I tell you, those blue lights now. That they've got, they you know, on the front of the cars, they're just so extremely bright. It makes me slow down when I see them. I think there's a state trooper coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go ahead and, and give you some relief here and, okay. and, and uh, uh, let you have your. Well, it, in addition to the budget that we talked about, and we continue to work on the education budget, which will probably come up this coming week, uh, the education budget will. Uh, there's been other legislation that has moved. It's been like at a snail's pace sometime, and it's been very contentious at times. But however, there's some good legislation, I think, that's come forth and come through the uh, Senate, and I, I want to mention a couple of them. We passed a bill that uh, authorizes the State Board of Education through the State Superintendent to intervene and exercise uh, direct control over the decision-making and the operations of a local school system that is totally failing academically, et cetera. And I, I think there's there's room, uh, there's room out there for that kind of intervention and uh, was pleased to support it. We have a, a bill that, and, and I'm also amazed over the years of the different subject matters that come from time to time. Uh, they're so different and they're, they're all, not all of them are are dealing with money and budgets, but rights and privileges and and uh, statues that that address day to day problems of the uh, Alabama electorate, or electorate, or the uh, state government's administration. So, the simple bill that was passed, Senate Bill 68. I, I thought was a, a very intriguing bill because it, we call it the voter. A fair ballot commission. A commission was put together which, have you ever been to a vote on a constitutional amendment and read it and you said, what did what is that it? say? Exactly. We are trying to simplify through this act a way to write it where those of us who interpret slower than others can, uh, hear, can understand what it is in real common language what the bill says, not what the attorney would want you to say. So that was, I thought, uh, just an intriguing piece of legislation for all of us who go to the ballot box and look at that. I've seen those constitutional amendments defined, and I said, yes, I voted for that, but, but that doesn't hardly mirror what it was that I remember voting for. It said the same thing, but it may have said it in a different way that was not clear. We're, we're trying to clarify the... Uh, the information on the ballot. Short story on that okay. one. Okay. That young lady over there sits next to me when we go vote. She goes, how'd you vote on that? Because <laughs> yeah. it's, hard, it's hard to understand sometimes, so that's great. Yeah. Well, and, and we looked out at our prison systems. We have many uh, lawsuits that are filed against the sheriff, against the warden, against the uh, commissioner of uh, corrections and, and against the state of Alabama, just a litany of them. And people have a right to access to the court, even prisoners. However, we put in place uh, to establish some guidelines for civil lawsuits, whereby the prisoners, those that are incarcerated in the state of Alabama, they have to exhaust certain administrative remedies before they can uh, file a, a lawsuit. That is, there's a filter out there before it goes to the courts where civil lawsuits will not be just uniformly uh, uh, in, in, in large numbers. We think it will, it will reduce some of that, uh, some of that uh, civil lawsuit in our prison system. Uh, another good piece of legislation. We have a, a, a bill dealing with application of foreign law. Uh, some of our states, and I, I 
I'd have to admit that I, we don't have any example in the state of Alabama, and we don't want any. But some states, or we're told there are states, where by the legislature or the court system uh, or the city uh, council or the county commissioners in this case, in, in one case, were referencing laws for the state of uh, that they were proposing or how they were ruling on a particular case and they were referencing laws from other countries as, as the basis for their uh, rulings, i.e. the United Nations. And we simply says in the state of Alabama that you, you, you've got to not base any court rulings, or any city uh, uh, regulations and rules or county commission decisions on, federal, on foreign law. It's got to be based on the our Constitution or on what our forefathers said and meant in their writings and the Jefferson Papers and uh, the things that were written by Thomas Jefferson and others uh, in the early part of our, uh, our nation as the basis for the laws of the state of Alabama and the rulings of our courts. And uh, we also pardon the Scottsboro boys. We felt like that there's been an ample amount of evidence tenfold that those young men were incarcerated, they were convicted because of the color of their skin. And it was our attempt to say, I reckon we shouldn't have done it, and we have, there's a full legislative pardon being passed for the Scottsboro boys. So, you know, we, we deal with different things almost daily, Eddie, and these are some of the different uh, things that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis up there, and uh, it's a very intriguing, entertaining uh, way to spend your time sometime, and you've been up there and visited with me, and I welcome you back again, by the way. We'll be up there, I okay. guarantee you. Good. Uh, we're going to wait for spring, summer to get along <laughs> this way, because I'll tell you, there's nothing more beautiful then going outside on that lawn outside the house in the Senate out there and looking at that that yard out there and the way it's it's just, it's just beautiful. Very nice. Montgomery is a beautiful community up yeah. there and, and uh, a lot of history. Well, I was there. I was there. When you're there for so long, you get to see a lot of things happen. I was there when we looked at the Capitol itself, where the governor is presently located. Mm -hmm. The legislature was in two wings of that building. And we looked at the building, and it was rotting. It was uh, needed in repairs. There'd been paint put on it, and just architectural, an old, a beautiful building with a lot of architectural history in it, a lot of pictures that were covered up with uh, spray paint and trying to doctor it, the sewage system. It, it didn't have telephone system built in. The air conditioning uh, and the humidity was, it was continuing to destroy our state capital. So the legislature moved out of the state capital, and we started the reconstruction of the Alabama state capital, and it's one of the prettiest buildings in the world. It is. It's a beautiful, beautiful Hands structure. Down. It Hands sure down. is. And the governor still has his office over there. And you'd be surprised if you haven't been there. When you walk in the door, you look to the left, and you see governor's office and a little door at that wing. Yeah. And you would think it would be this huge, humongous place, but it's it's not. Uh, actually, on that wing over there, he only has about, I think, four in a little small office for the secretary. I was surprised. Yeah. I was really surprised. Senator, we're going to go ahead and take one more of those breaks, okay. and then we're going to come back, close out just in a few minutes. When we come back, I want to talk to a man that's been in the Senate for all these years. I've never, ever really got, I've had many opportunities to talk with you, and I'm grateful for that. But things are changing times are changing and and if you while we're taking a commercial break if you can think about where do you see this the 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 current things that we have as far as the legislature and the house and and government is headed it seems like uh the media is getting a lot more control over it on a national level and even on a state level i'd like to get your opinion on that and what you think is going to happen in say the next 20 years Okay? Yeah. Folks, we'll be back with Senator Holly, and uh, we're surely glad and proud to have him here 
uh, every chance we have to, uh, to get them in. And uh, we'll be back with more. Just keep it uh, positive. Keep it real. <laughs> keep it real. <laughs> and keep God in it. He, he reminds you of Dr. Rydell. <laughs> <laughs> as many times we have on, he'll just make something up to say because he knows it, and he wrote it down one day, and he said, "I'm going to write that down." But uh, anyhow, this will be, we got one more time to do it. Well, so yeah. when we go to close out, folks, Senator Holly, God bless you. We'll be right back with more. Good morning, and welcome back to WKNI TV 25. I got her that time. Did you? Did, did you see that? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Senator Holly, we appreciate you coming on today and spending all this time with us. I know you got a busy schedule ahead of you, but uh, we asked you when uh, we left off the last break about what's coming up. Um, let's go ahead and talk about that. But I want to ask you how the Medicaid situation is uh, right now. There is a lot of focus on what was going to happen with Medicaid and everything with the state of Alabama and the Obamacare. Well. The general fund is the place you would f locate the funding for Medicaid, Medicare. And that, that, that budget, uh, we believe, is, is adequate to fund this year's expenses. You know, Eddie, as you look at the one-third, two-thirds match, the, the difference in us and the federal government, meaning their two-thirds and our one-third, we have to come up and tax individuals in the entire state. We have real money coming to Montgomery, our, our, our payments for our taxes, our income tax, right. corporate and all. The federal government's two-thirds is simply print, print and press. They don't have to put up any real money. So it doesn't hurt them or cause them any grief at all to put up a, an, a, another Ten, fifteen hundred million dollars. The, the cost really at risk with the with the state because our dollars are much more real than theirs is anyway. To do the best, our but the general fund budget funds that program. Where are we headed with it? First of all, we don't believe we in Alabama with our present tax structure, and we're not going to raise taxes to to fund it. We simply do not have the money that would be required to imp implement Obamacare. Now then, you can say, well, what are you going to do? We're, we're looking at, a, 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 I think, a, a division of, of, of the state divided up into different districts where the delivery service will be like a managed care on a uh, regional basis, like seven regions. You divide the state into seven regions and try to uh, divide Balance. it in such a way that the, the number of poor people wouldn't be all in one district, they'd be in equally in all seven. And then you would set up a managed care program whereby an entity would be in district one, let's say, and that uh, that uh, district one would would have a an administrator or a company that is uh, that's recognized as the one to implement the program. Is it the answer? I don't know. I, I don't know until we try. I won't know until, uh, first of all, it's, it's different than a centralized non-managed care right now. Right. It's just whatever you charge is whatever, uh, whatever gets paid. Uh, in this particular case, the entity that's managing the district would not make a profit if they don't manage that dollar given to them in a manner that would have some left over called a profit at the end of that quarter, that month, or that year. And, and it'll cause accountability. Well, you would hope so. Uh, managed care it would, would be fine in instances when uh, you give the patient adequate medical service but if it's simply just to make a profit and you get less care because you got to have less expenditure then you end up with an inadequate delivery system of medical care for the patients what i've no <clears throat> excuse me what i've noticed in the current situation whether you're insured or not insured uh you make a doctor's appointment mm -hmm. all right you're feeling bad 
okay, you've got sinus congestion and headaches that, had. that I had, or still have, <laughs> have. and uh, then you turn around and say, you know what, Doc, while I'm here, okay, my I, I've left toe has been bothering me. Well, you got to make another appointment to come back in mm-hmm. to get your left toe looked at. And under the situation that you're saying, it might be, well, you go in there and that doctor will have to see everything at one time and take care of the patient as a whole. Is that and you might have to travel a good distance to find that doctor because uh, the doctor next door to you in the same town may not be a preferred delivery doctor. Right. Any of the complications of this implementation of this act, and I forget how long they say it is with the rules and regulations. Some of them have yet to be published and some are yet to be printed and many of them are yet to be interpreted. That this is a uh, this is a program that it's, it's not over yet. We we don't know what we we don't know what to do with something. We don't know how it's going to impact us. Really, you can guess, but when you're dealing with this amount of money, it's not a time to be to be guessing. We need a a, a firm um, amount of cost to the state, and we'll we'll see if we can afford it. But right now, our Best judgment is, from what we've been told, it is a far reach to think that the present uh, general fund can sustain the uh, cost incurred by the Obama Care program. While we're on the same track, I know we're going to run over today, folks. And, and you sit there and you wonder, what are you going to talk about? And ten minutes ago, now there's a bunch of questions coming up yeah. at the end. But how do you feel about a lot of state or several states have taken? Uh, this into consideration where people on welfare uh, whether it be you know through food stamps or, or whatever program Medicaid or whatever um, having them have to do drug screening in order to be a recipient of that how do you feel on that well I think you lead by example and Trip Pittman had a bill the other day to require that and we encouraged him and would support an, an amendment that says that uh, uh, Alabama senators also shall have a drug test. You lead by example, and uh, if we show that it's an uneva- in, in, a, a not a invasive uh, procedure to have that to uh, uh, do, then uh, I think that's something that we need to tack to the testing of the welfare recipient. I'd even go one step further. What you were just talking about, and before. radio announcers. <laughs> Well, also <laughs> recipients of any health care packages as well, well because that your drugs and, and, and things like that, people that are abusing their system become yeah. more of a, a, a financial responsibility. Well, what we're trying to say is we really would like to help people who are in need. And in doing so, we don't want to penalize them for having a, a rough time and having to be on welfare and needing food stamps. But we really don't want them taking that uh, money that's abuse. given to them and 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 uh participating in the drug scene and and their and that was the purpose of the legislation and and like i said you lead by example and that would that would be something i'd be willing to do if it would and, help and i will too yeah. as a tv personality i would <laughs> and and uh I don't know about those radio people. That's another story altogether. Oh, yeah. All right. Now let's go ahead and jump into what we were supposed to jump into when we first started. I'm 50-something years old, okay, and you're 25. Okay. In all the years, I used to hear my mom and dad say this, in all the years I've been around, I've never seen something, and I'm going to tell you what it was, I've never seen the disrespect that individuals have nowadays for our government, yeah. we see it, it was here. What do they call it? Heresy? heresy? When when you would talk bad about the president of the United States, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, okay. I have seen people on on social pages and public and, and and talking to them, just desecrating the the president, okay, Congress, Senate, even you guys, local you know politicians. Okay. The media jumps in and just has a field day with it. And it all becomes about selling ratings and, and things like that. This is today, this is 2013, and we've come over the past 20 years to this 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 hole that, that looks just absolutely horrific when there's no respect 
for the leadership of our country or our states. And I'm not saying I agree with Obama. I'm not saying that. But he's still the president of the United States. Eddie, we talked a little bit this morning about the Constitution and the Second Amendment. There's other, con there's other parts of the Constitution that we, we need to be mindful of that are being exercised. The freedom of press. We do not want to infringe upon it and control it from the governmental side. We don't want that to happen. It may not be perfect, but it's a lot better than the alternative in some other nations. Then you've got the freedom of speech that all of us want to exercise. You, you have certain limitations. You can't, hire, you can't holler fire in a, theater, in a crowded theater. I don't know, can you holler fire in one that's not crowded? <laughs> uh, it, there are certain restraints uh, that the Constitution has. There are certain privileges and things that are granted to us in the Constitution. And is sometimes is how, how, ever how much we might differ with someone else's approach to how they describe our state government and they're disrespectful or whatever. Uh, we also got to remember that that Constitution that was drafted by our forefathers that we are so proud of gave them that right to do it. And... Uh, uh, I don't let's, like the commentaries. Well, let's, <laughs> let's, uh, I, I assume that we, what, what worries me is the uh, lack of filter that some of our young folks might have. I grew up in a time where, it, as you said, it was heresy to say that. So when I hear it now, I'm able to filter that and say, well, that's just, that's his or her opinion. Right. I, I would, uh, I'd be real cautious about being too critical although you have the right to be critical but to make uh, legal changes in our right to express ourselves through freedom of speech or through the uh, freedom of the press how about accountability and I'm going to ask you this and we'll get out of here but Facebook okay you don't have to be Eddie Lewis on Facebook you can be anybody and I still say in looking at that social media. There are people on there that are portraying to be somebody that they're not. I'm saying there are people that are portraying to be American citizens that are on Facebook that are utilizing that social media to cause confusion, hate, and discontent. I am still, I'm in, I'm in the same position there I was on the previous question. I'm afraid that some of our younger generation do not have the capacity to have the filter that they can recognize the difference on Facebook even within uh, those things that are expressed or those things that are said or those things that are presented to be able to filter out uh, that that is just pure uh, garbage. garbage. And there's some very nice things, such as my grandchild's picture on Facebook. Exactly. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> Keep it real. Real. Keep God in it. And I, that's the senator to telling us we're done. And uh, who am I to argue with the senator? But, thank you, uh, Eddie, senator, for having Thank me. you so and thank much. You. And uh, you tell that wonderful wife of yours, you're, you guys are invited to, I'm going to make you some of the best doggone ribs that you've ever had in your life. And uh, we're going to have I you. I look forward over. to it. All right, sir. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you for having thank me. Thank you for what you do for this state thank and thank you for what you do for our community. God bless you all. We'll see you here or, uh, tomorrow right after these messages.